Hi, and welcome back to Bold Books and Bones. In this episode, we will have a look at the Google of 500 years ago. And to understand that book better, we have a guest in this episode. Her name is Stephanie Leach. I will also share with you a book that will help you to find the old book that you definitely want to read. Welcome to part two of the episodes called Old Books and One Disaster. As you might remember from part one, the idea for these episodes started during a visit of the beautiful abbey of Mont Saint-Michel in the north of France, in Normandy. Because in places like this, books were read, they were studied, they were copied, and they were preserved. And that is why I like to visit these places. It is like visiting a location where the origins of our knowledge were stored. These episodes are about old books because they are the fundamental building blocks of all the knowledge that we have today. Old books can tell you how your field of interest began. And I learned from reading these old books that they can provide us with new insights that help us to better understand the topics that we are passionate about. And it doesn't matter if it's about art or history or graphic design, mathematics, engineering, biology or any other topic. But which old books are for you? Which old books have influenced the field that you are interested in or that you are passionate about? And which of these books would you like to read to give you new insights on the knowledge that you have today. One book that can get you started in finding just that book that you need and to get you closer to the early building blocks of knowledge is this one. And it's called Books That Have Changed History. It was a whole team that worked on it and the lead contributor to this book is Michael Collins. He's from Ireland and one of his ancestors once owned the famous book of Celts. Okay, back to the story. If you love books, then you will probably like this one too. Because it brings us up to speed on many old books that are still out there. It scans through a collection of essential books that have shaped the way we humans think and look at the world. I like this book because it is very accessible and well researched. And I discovered some old texts that I did not know about. And it made me curious to know more about them. This book covers a period from 3000 BCE all the way to the books from the 20th century that made a difference in our lives. So I think that whatever field you are interested in, the chances are high that in this book you will find one of the early building blocks of your field of expertise. Another remarkable book that is featured in this book is what we can call the Google of 500 years ago. The official name is the Nuremberg Chronicles. And the purpose of this book was very ambitious. The author wanted to write a book that contained the complete history of the world. And when they were planning this ambitious project, it was decided that this information should be accessible to a wide audience. That is why an, in those days, massive amount of 1,500 Latin copies and 1,000 German copies were printed. So this book was all about the knowledge of the world being accessible to everyone. Well, to everyone, uh, you needed to have money to buy a copy and you needed to have had the privilege of an education where you had learned to read and write, of course. Anyhow, this book is one of the ancestors of Google. It was published in 1493 and it has been very influential. The book was compiled by a gentleman called Hartmann Schädel, a physician and humanist from Nuremberg, Germany. Hence the name, the Nuremberg Chronicles. What is also cool about this book, and that is typical for Taschen, 
is that it comes with a smaller companion book that gives context and guidance on what the Nuremberg Chronicles is all about. It is written by a top expert and his name is Stefan Füssel. He is the director of book studies at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. And this companion book is all you need to get you started if you want to have a solid basic understanding of what this book is all about. Now the book can be explored from many different angles. It is definitely a treat for people who are passionate about history. It is for example interesting to see the way the author divided the time of the earth in seven periods. In those days people in that area of the world believed that they were living in the sixth time period. They also believed that the seventh and last time period was near and could be recognized by the arrival of the Antichrist. And it reads here von dem Antichrist. So about the Antichrist. And on the left you see then the image of the fight of Saint Michael and the Antichrist. And on the next page we see then the dance of death where people are rising from the dead at the end of times so they can meet their verdict on Judgment Day. Now after these rather spooky images and stories, I would like to introduce this book to you from a very different angle. Because we could ask ourselves why does this book stand out and why was it even republished in several high-end editions in 2018 by Taschen? Well, this is because there is more to this book than we might think by just looking through it. One of the reasons why this book stands out is very interesting for the graphic designers among you. This book was one of the first successful integrations of images and text. So the Nuremberg Chronicles is one of the early building blocks on the know-how of graphic design. It contains 1800 images and the way they integrated the text and the images was for those days an extremely innovative and experimental technique. And it has influenced the way images are used in books and in printed media in general. So to all the graphic designers out there, this book was made by the pioneers of your tribe. I wanted to learn more about this 500 year old book and especially about the graphic design part of it. And therefore I reached out to Stephanie Leach. She's a very interesting lady who knows a lot about old books and manuscripts. And her current book project is called The Art of Observation in the Early Modern Print. The Art of Observation? That is exactly the kind of topic I'm interested in. And Stephanie and I have something in common. We both own a copy of the Nuremberg Chronicles published by Taschen. And that shows the kind of book nerds that we are. We had a long talk and I learned a lot of new things and I'm excited to share with you some of the extracts from our conversation. Here we go. Hi Stephanie. Hi Levin. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights with the Bold Books and Bones community. I have a first question right away. Um, would you agree that some people say that this book is the Google of 500 years ago? I think, yeah, I think the Google of 500 years ago is, um, is a good comparison. What we're talking about here is a chronicle of the world. So. A, a, a uh, chronicle of world history plus a description of all of the parts of the world um so it was it was encyclopedic and i think that the producers also aimed to make a book that in the event you could only afford one book this would be the book to buy i think maybe one of the other comparisons to google that we can make is that in the book almost it, there, there's a search engine embedded in the book itself so there are chapter headings, there are tables of contents, um, things like indices, tables of contents, uh, even title pages, things that we take for granted in, in this period now uh, are not things that we could have taken for granted. And I think um, that something we'll see as well is that the pictures that were developed for the book also made it searchable. You could also, if you didn't feel like wading through large pages of text alone, 
you could probably find the information you needed to find via um, via the pictures. So I think we can say that this book was searchable via via the pictures. So the Nuremberg Chronicle completely revamped that idea in terms of searchability. So we learned from Stephanie that this was a really well designed book from the perspective of formatting. And that was in those early days not at all a given. And she shared also that a quite large team with different skills had worked on it and had made a preparatory document with clear indications where the text should be and where images should be integrated. So a very similar approach to what user interface designers would do today. Now when you look through the book we can discover some rather weird images. And we can find images and stories about mysterious events that according to the author had taken place throughout the history of mankind. I find these images very intriguing, but there is more. This book that claims to contain the history of the world also talks about the existence of monsters. I was of course very curious what Stephanie would teach us about this part of the book. So could you maybe help me out a bit with the monsters that are in the book? Uh, there are 21 uh, of, of those and it's hard to believe that these things ever existed. What, what's going on there? So I like the way you say help help me out with the monsters because one one might have needed help to understand them. The monsters had sort of had roamed uh, throughout late antiquity and throughout the medieval world and they appeared in lots of different kinds of publications. You'll see that they are um, they are like in thin strips, almost film strips. I think of them as very cinematic. You know, one monster appears after the other, almost like a creature feature. I want to call them a taxonomy of monsters because they're in such regularized units. Maybe if you could help us to decode one of these monsters at least. Uh, one of them has an enormous foot uh, and has only one leg. What, what is the story behind such, such an image? And why would people believe they did they existed? So um, the thing, I, the monster I think you're referring to is the is called a skiapod, and they come they are handed down from late antique uh, Greek sources. Uh, and then the word skiapod refers to a shadow foot. So this particular monster is traditionally located in Ethiopia, um, and where the sun is so hot that that monster needed the foot to to shade himself from the intense heat and then stories would kind of crop up around the monsters about like what else could he do with his foot and uh so when the sun went down then he could also run on that foot and um so it was an evolutionary advantage he used the foot to move quite rapidly and they're, they're recorded as being able to keep pace with with wild animals. So this book contains a taxonomy of monsters, but they all look very much over the top. So what happened here? Did people really believe that they existed? Was it possible that people who claimed to have observed them during their travels wrote down what they saw and then the graphic designers would try to translate the descriptions into visuals? If this would be the case, it would be a graphic design job that went very wrong. Or maybe I'm totally wrong, because I'm looking at this with eyes of a person from the 21st century. So Stephanie gave me more guidance on how to look at the monsters. Um, well, I'm not sure we call it a job that's gone wrong, because one of the selling points of this book was, um, was the array of of monsters. The, the sensational elements like that were always really good things to put into your book. Um, whether or not people believed it, of course, that's the question of reception and uh, it's very difficult to say, but I think that we can safely say that people wanted to believe these monsters. There's a, there's a, a grain of truth, I think, in all of these monsters. Maybe uh, a description that gets passed or down like a game of telephone and it changes along the way. So maybe, um, I don't know if you can show the Blemmy, but the, 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 the marvel with his eyes and his chest and his mouth and his chest, 
that might have emerged from a description of people far from the center who had a sort of a shorter neck. And so it seemed as though their faces were shrunk into their chest. But whether or not the, the illustrators are cooking these images up from written descriptions, um, I would say no, what they had been cataloged since antiquity as that. And they are represented in manuscripts in much the same way that they appear here. What's different here is how regular they are, how they appear in these regularized boxes. It kind of brings them together as, as, as a group. Uh, Stephanie, another topic that I found very interesting is that map that is shown uh, in the beginning of the book. In 1492, Columbus discovered the Americas. This is a map of the world. Uh, it is 1493, it's one year later, but there is no mention of the of the new world. Uh, what, what happened at the moment? Is the, is the information didn't come through or how do we need to understand that with our modern eyes of the 21st century? But I love the question in terms of Columbus because it really just shows us the stranglehold that um, the Colombian events still have on the on the modern imaginary. If you ask why it doesn't track those changes, I think that the reason for that is that the the books in which the Colombian news circulated were very different kinds of books. They were they were pamphlets two or three pages of uh, text at the most. They were circulating, and they were circulating in the German lands by, by, this, by this period. But it, it was a genre that didn't really stand to speak to this chronicle, um, because it was about newsworthy, uh, newsworthy events. Of course, Columbus himself was so confused about where he was. One wonders if it would have necessarily improved a map. Um, but I, I think these are, even though this book talks a lot about geography, that's a very different kind of geography than the reports of the Colombian, you know, quote unquote, discoveries. Now, Stephanie shared a lot of other interesting facts about this fascinating book. And here are some more insights that she shared about its graphic design. So Stephanie, um, what I learned from you in a, in a previous chat that we had is that these early graphic designers, they use some methods that are even still used today. And I think you even mentioned uh, the, the method of uh, stock images. Can, can, you, can you elaborate a bit on that? See, now you're making me wonder if the designers of this book didn't invent that idea of stock, uh, of stock images. Um, the wood, the designers of the book came up with something like, there are uh, 1800 images that are used in this book. But to generate that many images would have meant a lot of money going to the going to the woodcutter. So when there were serviceable images that could be repeated or reused, the the makers of the book decided that that's what they were going to do. And so what we have is um, those 1,800 images come from uh, roughly 645 um, wood blocks that would have been used from time to time, appear from time to time again in the book to represent um, kings whose appearances were not known to peoples. It would have made much more sense to just reuse one of those blocks than to have it cut uniquely, especially in the case where we didn't know much about what their appearances were like anyway. Indeed, if you look carefully through the pages, then you can find some images that are reused. The same image is used to represent different people. So we can see an example of the beginnings of stock images. We can even see that the same image was used to represent different city views. And the only difference between these images was that they had a different name tag. So if this book contains monsters that did not exist and images that were reused with different name tags above it, then I started to wonder if fake news existed also in those days. Or maybe this is a comparison that goes too far. So I ask advice from Stephanie. I like to share some of the abstracts from her thoughts on this particular topic. 
No, I, I think you can definitely say that fake news existed in that day too. I'm not sure that it was the intention of this book to circulate fake news. If we want to talk about other publications that did circulate fake news, this was this was the stuff of pamphlets. In fact, pamphlets that predicted um, plague or that showed comets predicting plagues, that chronicled the birth of monstrous peoples. A uh, little bit like the monsters in here, but like newer monsters and monster, monstrous births that happened in, in one's own backyard. And those were the stuff of, um, of, of fake news. What is also cool is that we learn from Stephanie that the enhancement or in some cases the manipulation of images like we know today through Photoshop was something that also existed already. We have uh, an image that accompanies a German version of Vespucci's account that was published in Magdeburg in 1506. And that is an image that's generated from two separate woodblocks, one depicting Adam and Eve on one hand, and uh, one depicting a king. I think it's King Solomon that it originally depicts. But in this new context, the king becomes the Portuguese regent <clears throat> who's sending Vespucci. Uh, and the the people in the fig leaves who were actually Adam and Eve now represent inhabitants of the New World. So images were also altered um, or, or photoshopped, we could say, uh, to generate like to generate new news. So fake news was not just the reports, but fake news were it was also generated by by the images. So by having a closer look at the Google of 500 years ago, we discovered the beginning of stock images and early examples of photoshopped visuals where the meaning of images are altered to better fit the context of the book. That in itself is at that moment in time not totally new, but the difference is that because of the printing press that came into use in this period, this visual information, being it fake news or not, could be spread rapidly and to a wide range of people that started to use this information. That is so relevant to our current 21st century world where all of us have an overflow of visual information on a daily basis. So what we learn through Stephanie is not just stuff that is nice to know. This is all about understanding the dynamics of spreading information and retaining new knowledge from visual information. And that is why I'm very interested to learn more about the book that she is writing at the moment. Oh, Levin, that's such a great question because you're the person I'm writing for. Um, it is exactly about how people tried to hone their observation skills in the 16th century. I have wondered for a long time how we came to have visual consensus about about knowledge and how that information came to people and how they agreed that that was useful information. And I have located a, a, a number of early modern genres that I think it was their prerogative to teach the reader how to make visual decisions in the world. How to make visual decisions in the world that is of course so cool to know more about. In the book that she is writing, she focuses for example on the early publications of the 16th century on physiognomy, which was the old practice of assessing a person's character or personality from their outer appearances. That is not only interesting for psychologists and graphic designers, because these kind of early modern books are the basic building blocks of visual information that is now evolved into, for example, digital face recognition. It is something that our smartphones apply to us every day now to give or to deny us access. So Stephanie argues that it is because of images in printed books and as a consequence, the possibility to spread these images 
to a wide audience that we humans started to develop new observation skills to decode visual information. I'm so happy that Stephanie was so kind to have this conversation and I'm of course already very excited about the concept of the book. So for sure we will invite Stephanie back to Bold Books and Bones once her book is ready. Hope you liked this episode and if you do please become a part of the Bold Books and Bones community by subscribing to the channel and click on that notification bell so you don't miss our next episode where I will talk about the disaster that happened. Hope to see you soon at Bold Books and Bones. Bye. I a shout out to my brother who gave me this book in grad school. Oh, nice. <laughs>